Our program is Women Saints of All Ages, and tonight we'll focus on martyrs. But in all things, let us begin a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Grant us, Lord, the lamp of charity, which never fails, that it may burn in us and shed its light on those around us, and that by its brightness we may have a vision of that holy city where dwells the true and never failing light, Jesus Christ, our Lord. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Well, the story of saints in the church is clearly focused on men. Male saints outnumber women 15 or 20 to 1. And most of the accounts of the lives of women saints, when they exist, have also been generally written by men. These stories often feature the stereotypical, pious, uh, feminine traits of passivity, timidity, submission, and obedience. But this study seeks to uncover the real story of these women. And these stories should exhort all of us to live a life of faith in a dutiful, loving, and courageous manner. This episode will focus on martyrs. In the early church, women were largely invisible. They were not heard from or seen, so stories of martyrs were few and rare. And many early martyr stories are conflated and may actually be an amalgam of many saint stories. As time progressed, Women, women took on a larger and more visible role in society, and martyred saints emerged in detailed stories that societies could not dismiss. The faith and courage of these women martyrs in all ages cannot be ignored or denied. Let us begin with St. Agnes. Uh, she lived in Rome, and she did not live very long at all. She's the best known of the virgin martyrs. She may have been an amalgam of various virgin martyrdoms. Uh, she was reportedly the daughter of a wealthy Roman family. She rejected all suitors and she said, be gone sting of sin, food of crime, poison of my soul, for I am already given to another lover. This was written about her by a man in the 14th century. So the source is quite remote from the subject. She's believed to have been arrested in the persecution of Diocletian. And she freely confessed to being a Christian when she was arrested. She was most likely from a wealthy family and she refused to worship the Roman gods. So some tradition says she was to be burned alive, but the flames went out and so she was instead beheaded. She was reportedly only 12 or 13 years old. Now, St. Ambrose writing of her in the late 300s said she was threatened with death and was absolutely fearless. Maidens of that age are unable to bear even the angry looks of parents and are wont to cry at the pricks of a needle as though they were wounds. Well, Ambrose wrote that to his younger sister. So he may have been using the example of St. Agnes to try to instill a deeper faith in his sister. Agnes is one of 22 virgins that are depicted in murals on the walls in the church of San Apollinare in Ravenna, which was built in the sixth century. And this is what that wall looks like. You see the, uh, the three men in the red hats uh, to the right of the screen. Those are depicting the, the Magi, uh, the three wise men, if you will. And because there's three on the wall, maybe that's where we get the we three kings of Orient are. The, all, all the women who uh, follow uh, are all uh, virgin saints. And Agnes is the very first. Uh, and you'll notice that um, they have a crown on a plate. They've all, they've all died and they are all, all been crowned and they're all saints. Within 100 years of her death, Agnes had been written about by Ambrose, Jerome, Pope Damasus I, and the poet Prudentius, and many others. Her femininity and weakness stood in strong defiance of the cruelty and oppression of the Roman Empire and celebrated the coming of the faithful and loving God our Lord Jesus Christ. Her feast day is January 21st. The next saint we have lived many years later, uh, in the 1500s, as a matter of fact, and her name was Saint it was Margaret Clitheroe, and she was born and lived in York, England, the northern part of England. She was born in 1553, and at that time they had a um, arrangement called the Elizabethan Settlement. If you'll recall, Henry VIII, who was Catholic, uh, wanted to divorce his wife, so he created a new church, the Church of England. He broke with 
Catholicism, and he actually made it illegal to be a Catholic. So his daughter, Elizabeth, when she became queen, she entered legislation, and they had this uh, this r- rule about how you would attend church. Now, her father was a leading citizen, and he was a candle maker, which implies that he was a closet Catholic because the Catholics were the ones who were using the candles. In 1571, she married a man named John Clitheroe. He was a butcher, and she went to live with him in the area where all the butchers lived, which was called the Shambles. It was a street in the city of York. John was a widower and older than than Margaret, and he brought many sons to the marriage. Three years after her marriage, Catherine became a Catholic, and we don't know exactly why. Now, the Act of Supremacy in 1559 declared Elizabeth I to be the head of the church in England, and it required church attendance. Now, nobody was questioned about their faith. Catholics might leave early or only attend prayer services. There was a lot of support for this easygoing practice. The success of this policy however, prompted Pope Pius V to issue a papal bull excommunicating Queen Elizabeth. So what was happening is Catholics were going to the Anglican churches. They may not have been, been believing what was going on, but they were there, and there were no churches for Catholics they were, unless they were private, hidden in, in houses or barns. So the Pope got wind of this easygoing um, situation, and he decided to excommunicate Queen Elizabeth. Well, Margaret, the devout Catholic, was imprisoned three times for avoiding the state church. So she'd be imprisoned and they'd let her go. She'd be imprisoned, they'd let her go. Well, ironically, she spent so much time in jail that she learned to read while she was in prison. And, and at this same time, priests were smuggled into the country to meet the needs of the faithful. And many Catholics would build priest holes into their houses where priests could be sheltered and avoid capture. Margaret did this also. And apparently her husband was unaware of her activities, or so he declared. However, they sent their oldest son abroad to study at a Catholic college, and John was called to court to explain this. The Council of the North, that is the area around Yorkshire, was not as easygoing as the judges near London. London was a bit more cosmopolitan and accepting of different faiths. In the North, they were Puritans, and they were strict interpreters of the laws. So Margaret, to make money, operated a school out of her house. And one day, a man broke into her house searching for priests. He scared the teacher. He wasn't a priest, but he was just a teacher that was there. And he went to hide in the priest hall because he knew about it. Well, they arrested Margaret when one of the students told them about the hidden room. And at this time, only Catholic priests were executed when apprehended. Others usually received a prison sentence. But Margaret was determined to become a martyr. Clergy from the Church of England visited her and begged her to conform to the laws and thereby avoid this needless death. At her trial, she refused to plead, saying, Having made no offense, I need no trial. Well, the judge in her trial pleaded with her. Consider on it. You have your husband and children to care for. Cast not yourself away. And the evidence against her was very slim. No priests had been found at her house. No one had seen anyone. But she refused to plead to the charges. And for that, there was an ancient punishment called the pene forte, adure, which, or, which meant death by being crushed by heavy weights. Well, <laughs> This crude form of execution, the person would be taken to the lowest part of a damp prison, stripped and have as much weight laid upon her as she could bear. And after three days, if she did not recant, her hands and feet would be tied to post and a sharp stone would be placed under her back. Then more weights would be added until she was crushed to death. Now, the English are generally a very civilized race and have added a lot to uh, history and society and civilization but they also have some pretty crude things. And this is one of those. It's like hang drawing and quartering. It's a very crude punishment. St. Thomas Fairfax, who was a member of the Council of the North, he decided he was gonna save her. So they told her that if she would listen to one sermon by the Bishop of Durham, that is the Anglican church, the Anglican bishop, she would be released, but she refused. So finally, they asked women to go to her and determine if she was pregnant. 
They said they thought she was, but it was too late, and the sentence went forward. On March 25, 1585, Margaret was executed. It was Good Friday. There were only a few witnesses. Beggars had been hired to carry out the execution. Nobody that knew her wanted to do it. In the end, they did not make Margaret suffer for three days, and she expired after just 15 minutes. Father John Mush's true report of the life and death of Mrs. Margaret Clitheroe is the principal source of what we know of these events. Margaret Clitheroe was beatified in 1925. She was canonized and became a saint in 1970, declared as such by Pope Paul VI, and he named her one of the 40 martyrs of England and Wales. Our next saint is Blessed Madeleine Fontaine. And she lived in Arras, France, which is up near the Belgian border, in the, in the mid-1700s. She was born into a poor peasant family. By the time she was 16, her mother, her stepmother, and 11 children had died in her home. In 1748, with no desire for marriage, she entered the Daughters of Charity, leaving only a brother and a sister to care for her father. Can you imagine her mother or her stepmother, 11 children, all died in her family? So she became a religious sister, she, and she followed a nursing vocation for 40 years. She was in her late 60s and in charge of a small mission in Iraq when the French Revolution erupted. The period of time from July 1793 to July 1794 came to be called the Reign of Terror. It was during this time that thousands were led to the guillotine, especially priests and religious sisters. Pagan ceremonies and pageants were reintroduced. The church was mocked and derided. Oaths were administered that lacked any recognition of God. And the homes of the wealthy were seized and their occupants murdered, often by guillotine. And for a while, the city of Arras was kept free of this turmoil and suffering. Most of it happened around Paris. But one day, Mother Madeline and her sisters were forced to work in hospitals selected by the Revolutionary Guards. They were also forbidden to wear their habits. In November 1793, a new mayor arrived. His name was Joseph Lebon, and he was an apostate priest, a priest who had denounced his vows, and he was a fanatical friend of Robespierre, who was the architect of the Reign of Terror. And he targeted Madeleine and her sisters almost immediately. This man had great hatred for the church. Fearing for her sisters, Mother Madeline sent her two youngest sisters to Belgium for their safety. They were not far from the border. Another was sent home to her parents, and Madeline and the remaining four did the work the guards demanded. On February 5th, the nuns were evicted from their house. Nine days later, they were arrested and imprisoned as enemies of the state. So for nine days, they had to wander the street and sleep in barns and try to take any alms from anybody that would, would help them. And then they were arrested again. And Mother Madeline was now 71 years old. Her other sister, Sister Francois, was 40, 49. Sister Therese was 47. And Sister Jean was 42. The evidence against them was all fabricated, and they were not allowed to speak in their own defense. They were convicted and sentenced to death, which would occur on the following day. The sisters went to their death singing Ave Maristella, and Mother Madeline was the last to die. And as she climbed the stairs, she cried out, Listen, Christians, we are the last victims. The persecution is going to stop. The gallows will be destroyed. The altars of Jesus will rise again gloriously. In July 1794, Robespierre and Le Bon were overthrown and executed by guillotine, and the reign of terror concluded. Mother Madeleine Fontaine and her sisters, Daughters of Charity, were beatified on June 13, 1920, by Pope Benedict XV. Our next saint is Saint Hermina Griveaux, and she will live out her passion in China in the late 1800s. She was born in the Burgundy region of France, that's sort of like in the middle and to the east, in the year 1866. She joined the Franciscan Sisters of Mary, called for obvious reasons, the White Franciscans. And in 1898, 
as Mother Mary Hermina, she was asked to bring her sisters to Shanxi, China. Well, the Chinese valued boy children and little girls were often sold or given away or abandoned to die. The sisters arrived ready and committed, but there were Chinese women in place to care for the children. The sisters were told to teach religion and that was all. The priests and friars who had requested the sisters had made no effort to learn the Chinese language or the customs of their charges, which was an issue. They had no rapport with the people. The Chinese who worked in the orphanage apparently had little regard for discipline, and they allowed the children to do whatever they liked. The sisters set about to promote concepts of cleanliness and order into the children's lives, and they did this almost immediately. They built a dispensary and a medical clinic, and many from the nearby villages came to use those services, and they were grateful and began to see the sisters as friends. Classes were initiated soon, and the children became orderly and well-behaved, and the sisters began to teach the children. Now, Chinese politics were quite disruptive in the 19th century, and there was a series of conflicts known as the Opium Wars that occurred in the 1860s, and all the major ports in China had been seized and put under European control um, in, during these conflicts. And the China missions, which were usually inland, often bore the brunt of resentment from the Chinese over the state of affairs. In January 1900, Mother Hermina wrote home to tell her superiors that the road to Peking had been blocked by revolutionaries and that a priest and six others had been killed by Chinese revolutionaries in a nearby town. It was still peaceful in Tuang, uh, at the mission uh, through Easter 1900, however. But in late April, a new viceroy was appointed who was anti-European. The bishop told the sisters to dress in ordinary clothes and take the children and escape, but they would not abandon the priests or the mission. This was the beginning of the Boxer Rebellion, Yo Ho Chuang, Yi Ho Chuang, Ho Chuang. The Chinese came and took away all the children from the mission and Monsignor Grazzi walked through the streets to the Viceroy to protest this action. He was spit upon, beaten, and it was quite a courageous thing to do. And then two days later, Monsignor Grazzi and seven other priests were publicly executed while the sisters watched. Then one by one, the sisters were beheaded by a swordsman. The mission was burned to the ground and all records lost. Two boys related these events Mother Hermione Griveau was beatified in 1946 by Pope Pius XII, and she and many of her sisters and priests in the missions were canonized as martyrs of China by Pope John Paul II on October 1st in the year 2000. The feast day of St. Hermione Griveaux is July 9th. Our last saint we have uh, in this series is um, Blessed Anarite Nengapita. And she lived in the town of Baf Wabaka Zaire in the um, 1960s. So European nations began the colonization of the African continent in earnest all through the 19th century. But after World War II, these nations all began to withdraw, some more readily and more peacefully than others. And probably the most catastrophic transfer uh, of power took place in the Belgian Congo uh, if you're as old as me, you'll remember the scenes on television every night of, of uh, warfare and suffering. Uh, the Belgian Congo later became known as Zaire. And the Catholic missions in Zaire were few and scattered. They became a symbolic target for the rebels who are known as the Simbas, which means tigers. Or lions, actually, means lions. Uh, Marie Clementine Anarite Nengapita was a young teaching nun at the mission school in Bafwabaka. And these sisters of the congregation of the Holy Family were well aware of the danger they faced. Bishop Wittebols of Wamba had been murdered, and they were told by other superiors in the church that their nuns' habits would be no protection from the vicious Simba rebels. And the attack came suddenly at lunchtime on November 29, 1964. The Simbas told the sisters to not be afraid. They had arrived to save them from the Americans. This was, of course, untrue. There were no Americans in Zaire 
There are no Americans in this conflict. But the Simbas told the, the sisters they must leave and that they would take them to their headquarters. Well, the sisters were herded into a truck. And then the Simba commander saw a sister saying the rosary. He ordered them beaten and stripped of all religious articles. Then the youngest, Sister Anarite, was beaten and taken to the officer's quarters for the night. Mother Kasima told the Simbas that it was not possible for her to go with them. Her vows could not be violated. And Sister Anarita hung to Mother Kasima and would not let go. What you are asking is impossible. I cannot commit this sin. Kill me instead. And at this moment, the Simba soldier began to beat her with his rifle, shouting to his comrades that she had attacked him. The soldiers rushed over and stabbed Sister Anarita repeatedly until the officer took out his pistol and shot her several times. The sisters took Anarita's dead body into the house and clung to each other, resisting the Simbas. The Simba who had attempted to rape Sister Anarita came back and threatened other sisters, screaming and shouting, but finally went away. The sisters were not molested further. And finally, after a few days, government troops entered the area, chased away the Simbas, and restored order. In 1980, Pope John Paul II made his first trip to Zaire, where so many Catholics had suffered during the uprisings. He visited Sister Anarita's tomb in the cathedral uh, in the city of Iziro. And on his second trip to Zaire in 1985, just five years later, the Pope approved Anarita's cause and she was beatified. He reminded all present that a martyr is literally a witness. Martyr, the Latin word martyr means witness, witness to the faith, having given her all for the love of the Lord. So Sister Agnes, St. Saint Agnes, St. Margaret Clitheroe, Blessed Madeleine Fontaine, St. Hermione Griveau, Blessed Anarite Nengapita, pray for us. Let us close in prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks for listening. Peace be with you.